Hi, I'm Dan Hammermesh. I'm Network Director at the IZA and Editor-in-Chief of the IZA World of Labor. Uh, I'm really pleased to introduce this set of interviews I had over the past week with leading labor scholars in several different countries. Uh, all of them have thought about the coronavirus crisis, its effect on labor markets, effects on the economy. And I just want to chat with them and get a perspective. The interesting thing is the countries covered have had vastly different experiences in terms of how they've managed the crisis, the extent to which uh, cases have occurred, deaths have occurred. I thought it'd be really interesting to have this kind of uh, comparative set of interviews going on. The set of interviews was put together by the co-producers, Theodora Ruseva and Olga Notmeyer, and the script was mostly written by Theodora herself. So I hope you enjoy this, and I think it's just really fascinating to look at how different things are across the different markets. Hey, good morning. I guess it's morning in Canada too, isn't it? Uh, it is. Good morning. Saturday morning, 30th of, 30th of May. I have with me Phil Oriopoulos, who's professor of economics at the University of Toronto, Canada. And I'm here to ask him a bunch of questions about the impact of COVID-19 on the economy, what's being done in Canada. Just a little note, Canada, I view as our, it's our neighbor to the north in the U.S., and it's a mirror close by. And yet, for those of you who don't know the facts, this mirror has done very well with the COVID epidemic, pandemic, compared to the U.S. The death rate in Canada is just barely half of what it is in the U.S. I think a tremendous achievement for two countries that are so very, very similar. So I want to, just in terms of the economy, Phil, what has been done by the Canadian federal government to aid the economy during this crisis, and what has been the most effective of those measures? Well, um, there's been two main measures. Uh, one is for anyone unemployed. Uh, they've set up some um, uh, way to get money quickly to uh, anyone in that situation. And uh, it's about $1,200 uh, every week. Um, and it's for um, it's been going on for a while now, and it's pretty easy to um, to get the money. So rather than um, having to uh, comp some complicated application process, you just have to click literally like three or four buttons online, and then the money starts flowing. The second thing is that uh, they've set up a process by which um, employers who have lost more than um, Seventy-five percent of their revenue can um, apply for uh, aid, which um, uh, tries to allow uh, um, enough money to flow in to pay for their employees uh, at roughly a rate of, of um, seventy-five percent of the employees' salaries. And so they get the money only if they maintain the employment at seven at, at a certain level, right? You have to keep the people working. Correct. Let me ask you this then. These are all designed to reduce the rise or diminish the rise in unemployment. Last month in April, what was the unemployment rate already compared to earlier this year? Uh, sorry, the unemployment rate this month? Most uh, recently, yeah. Changed? Yeah. Uh, it's now at around 13, 14%, I think. So it has gone up. That's very much like in the U.S. I mean, in April, it was almost 15 percent. I expect it'll be 18 or 19 a week from today. The report comes out. So that's very similar. This is actually interesting because in the European countries, unemployment has not risen as much because unlike America and Canada, they have these short time compensation things, which pays the employer to pay people to stay at work. And those would be very successful. Uh, let me ask you this. I know you've done some work on this. To what extent has the crisis, in your view, affected inequality in Canada? I don't have the, the data to kind of see that, but there's certainly a lot of talk about this going on. Um, I would say it's, the discussions are very similar to um, what what's happening in the U.S. and other countries pointing to that, that um, the crisis is affecting some groups certainly more than others, and it appears that the the um, 
you know, the, the ones that are being most hit are the ones who are um, um, more in disadvantaged backgrounds, whereas the ones from uh, the Zoomers, right, who have a <laughs> more professional background, who can hang out uh, and they Zoom um, for a lot of part, they're, they're uh, mildly inconvenienced compared to a lot of people hitting the shock. Another big source of inequality is around uh, what's going on in education right now. So um, there's a lot of us doing research on education um, uh, acutely aware of the, um, um, the, the disproportionately higher challenges that um, those from more disadvantaged backgrounds are facing trying to have parents manage homeschooling while uh, both are working uh, or both are unemployed in, in very stressful situations. Uh, internet connections, um, uh, school situations. Um, there, there's, all, all, there's already been a, you know, a lot of research on the potential that uh, students outside of um, school during the summer, um, those from um, more disadvantaged backgrounds, their learning trajectory more and uh, the crisis now is just exasperating that uh, and, and there's a lot of concern that that's going to um, um, multiply and, and have a um, big strong effect on uh, learning differences and learning gaps that pop up in the next year or two. Is there any thought of requiring people to go to school, either homeschool or some kind of Zoom thing to the summer, which is for non-North Americans, that's unusual. But might this be a way of thinking of combating this inequality rise and the losses of the past few months? I think some school districts are considering it. It's a bit of a more like a patchwork type of policy. Some schools are trying something, some schools are not. I, I think the biggest challenge, even with that, even with the school boards that say we're going to have a summer program, is... Um, uh, the the challenge of engaging these kids and keeping them interested in going yeah. online for you know while it's beautiful outside and that they have to do math it, it can be challenging without a parent setting up a routine maybe staring yeah. over your shoulder and kind of encouraging that with a, a lot of times um, parents from from more disadvantaged backgrounds as students from more dis disadvantaged backgrounds just don't have that right. Yeah, actually, that's why we in Texas have an advantage if we did that, because outside it's too hot. Nobody wants to go outside. You might as well go to school in the summer then. Next question about that. I know you've written on this, including for us. So far, as I remember, schools in Canada, secondary schools, universities finished up quite early, as I remember, in late April, as I remember from my time there. Uh, how are the students who are graduating doing in the job market, or is it just completely dead? My impression is pretty completely dead at this point. Um, that's one thing that another policy of the Canadian government uh, has done is that they've just set up um, basically any graduate who who um, uh, who who says that they they were looking for work and can't find any will get two thousand dollars from the government um, uh, as a way to try to you know backstop some of the losses. Um, but in in general, the the situation is pretty dire for for these graduates, at least at the moment. Um, the, there are some uh, employers hiring, but it's obviously uh, the kinds of jobs that are uh, employers are looking for, and the available the number of those jobs available are, are quite small. So presumably, as is always the case, STEM majors are doing fairly well. They're still hiring for STEM. Whereas liberal arts majors are having problems, or is that not true currently in Canada? So, uh, at least um, based on some of my past research, I would predict that that's the case. I don't um, okay. really know for sure, but it does appear that you know those who are um, um, graduating with fields of study that tend to pay higher um, have the best chance of um, not. Uh, feeling so much hardship from the situation, but nevertheless, I think they're still feeling it. Um, 
we found in, in our research uh, a few years ago looking for Canada for graduates in a, in a recession that um, uh, on average, uh, graduates uh, entered the labor market and um, found jobs that were paying less in firms that tended to pay less as well. But it was those who were in STEM that um, not only um, uh, had the, the least wage loss at the beginning, but they also had the fastest catch up um, uh, among the group. Whereas for those in more humanities and, and um, uh, fields that tended to pay less, they had the largest uh, short term shock and some of their wages never even recovered. I see. Oh, dear. Let me ask you a question specifically, Canada. Is there any discussion about <clears throat> differences in the impacts on French Canada and English Canada, or is that irrelevant? Um, I think most of the policies right now are, are coming at the federal level for support, for financial support. So I think that that's the case. When you say sort of what's going on, the, the immediate thing that pops up is sort of the the the, um, uh, the number of cases. Uh, for some reason, um, Quebec and Ontario have not handled uh, have not flattened the curve nearly as much as the other regions. And so Canada's situation is starting to become very much a one of a big regional differences in terms of how oh. under control the, um, the the pandemic situation is. That may reverberate in terms of an economic impact. It may take longer for um, businesses to um, get back to some normalcy, both in Quebec and, and, and Ontario compared to the other provinces. Is that true even compared to British Columbia, which I view as fairly urban like Ontario and Quebec? Even they are doing okay, you think? Yeah, it, it was for a while that in Vancouver and in British Columbia that their number of cases per capita, uh, number of new cases was higher, um, but they right. seem to have had uh, gotten a, a better grip on the situation um, and and um, reacted more strongly, especially with retirement homes. Um, and in in the in the last little few weeks, it's become apparent that uh, BC's situation now much more under control than than Ontario and Quebec. Hmm. Hmm. I'm just amazed talking to people around the world about the whole thing, how there is no one answer to containing this. I look at countries that have done well, like Germany and to a lesser extent, Canada, others that we've had the biggest lockdown, I think, in the world in the United States or one of them, and we're doing rather badly. I just don't know that there's any one magic bullet that does this, and there's just a tremendous diversity of results and experiments. Just, just amaze me. Let me ask you a final question, and that is, well, uh, we've let me just say, uh, <laughs> sure. I, I think there's a lot of uncertainty around how this virus behaves, and and I think that there's not a. a there hasn't been a lot of accurate information in trying to understand and predict its behavior. And that's contributing to this heterogeneity in like responses. There is one thing I think, which is how badly this thing is, is playing out in, in retirement homes. And I think that oh, yeah. the, the regions that managed to contain that quicker are doing a lot better. I mean, I think that's one big difference, at least across the regions in Canada you're seeing, is that something like 80% of our cases are can can be um, traced back to the retirement homes. And if that was better contained from the beginning, we'd be looking a lot better. And I wonder how much of that is playing out in other areas as well. That's certainly true in New York State, where a remarkable fraction of the deaths are in retirement homes, not surprisingly. But these are that's basically sort of giant Petri dishes, I think, for the virus to proliferate. I think more and more places now that we're opening up here in the U.S. are telling, you know, we'll be open, but if you're over age 65, you can't come in. So essentially, we're enforcing informal way, uh, age discrimination against people like me. Let me ask you this. We've all gotten good at Zoom. We're doing blue jeans. 
How do you think this is going to affect the economy and the world over the next few years now that we're all, I don't know, you're not quite correct. My younger siblings are baby Zoomers. You've heard of baby boomers. These are boomer Zoomers. That's a new terminology we just cooked up. How is this going to affect things for such people in the future, do you think? Oh, I don't have my crystal ball here, Dan. I can speculate, but I, I do think that the the students generally realize this is not the um, same quality of education that they're getting um, compared to being on campus or in school. Um, I, it's cheaper. Uh, in some cases, it's more convenient. Um, so one prediction is that there's going to be two tiers of education. One where it's just yeah. more expensive, but you you pay to be on campus and you pay to get a live person and it's going to be really expensive. And another path will be, let's just do all this online massively at scale and it'll be a lot cheaper. And, and you'll kind of create two divisions of education that way and um, you know see how that plays out. I have heard that there's a lot of uh, businesses that are literally realizing we don't need to pay for this giant asset in the middle of financial, you know, the downtown, we're just gonna stop doing it. Granted, these are tech companies yeah. that are starting to do this, but you, you can't imagine that um, some people will, will realize that maybe they can lower costs by having people more at home. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I get restless a little bit being on Zoom all day, and, and uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. I certainly miss the campus environment. There is uh, a social element of this, right, where being together with people um, is important for us, and often productivity happens in between tasks. Right. And, and for our case, it's like in between a meeting at when you go traveling, that's often where the ideas come about from talking to someone over coffee or from going for a walk. And we don't have that anymore. And, and um, it's expensive, but but that's where um, it, you know, it, it's more productive and it feels better. So I certainly miss it. I, I hope we don't all go back to Zoom. That would be weird. It would indeed. So let me ask you a final question. What is the University of Toronto doing about next fall? Are they going to have live instruction or are they going to be all Zoom or a mix of both? So far, the official policy is to prepare for both, be able to accommodate both types of students. Um, so I think they, anticipate, they want to be on campus as much as possible, but they recognize that that's just not likely to be the case for large classes or maybe for international students. So uh, instead, yeah. they're saying, well, I, I think they're, they're, they're asking for the worst of both worlds. We're going to have to uh, have a course that accommodates both. And that makes it tricky because um, you can't just take advantage of the only online setup which might be better for those who are just doing online. Um, on the other hand, having to just go up uh, in a class, a small class, and just tape it while you do your lecture is not the best experience either. So I don't know, that, that's where they're at on that. Okay, I'm looking at my own college in New York City and what they're talking about doing is having you lecture live for upper division classes. And simultaneously, those who couldn't get here, which is pretty international students, uh, will be zoomed in. So I'll be able to call on the student in Beijing if he or she has a question during my econometrics lecture. So in a sense, I mean, I, I like to think this is the best of both worlds, although knowing the university administrations, they may turn it into the worst. One just doesn't know. <laughs> I think what it is is they'll be zooming in at one, like four in the morning for them. So that's a little bit painful. Ooh, the, that's the a bad. I hadn't is, thought about that problem. Um, the other thing is that uh, online, um, I think, is better in short increments, time increments. To have yes. a two-hour lecture and be expected to just watch the screen and pay rapt attention to it, 
Um, it, it's just, we're not super well designed for that, I think. Well, you've done very well paying rapt attention for the last 15, 20 minutes. I want to thank Phil Oriopoulos for being with us this afternoon and morning. Phil, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks,